Hi everyone. My name is Živa Kleindienst, and together with Tadej Vindiš, Aleksandra Kostić, and Peter Tomáš Dobrila, I am one of the curators of the International Festival of Art, Technology and Science, Kiblix 2021, entitled Virtual Worlds Now. I welcome you on behalf of Kibla, who has been organizing this festival since 2002. In line with Kibla's long-term research focus on XR technologies and art, in scope of RUK, Network of Art and Cultural Research Centers, and considering that the past year has probably been the most virtual year we have lived so far, the key question we're asking for this year's festival's edition is what are the virtual worlds now? Today, we continue with already ninth event in the series of panel discussions, which are thematically focused and in which we bring together international professionals in the fields of art, XR technologies and science. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce today's moderator, founding director of Gazeli Art House, Mila Askarova, and our guests, co-founder and director of Museum of Contemporary Digital Art, Serena Tabaki, artist and collector, David Diamond, and artist at Fornils and Brandon Daves, who will be speaking about the past, present, and future of the digital art market. For Q&A, you can use the chat on the right side of the screen, where you can post your questions and comments, which will be read by the moderator on your behalf. Mila, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jiva and Tadej and everyone at Kibla for the, for the invitation and for letting me put this wonderful panel of speakers together. And of course, thank you for, to our panelists for agreeing to be part of this. So today we're addressing a fascinating and very topical discussion on the digital art market, its past, present and future. Um, no pressure in tackling the most talked about topic within the arts today and no pressure in resolving some of the issues that a few players within the field are facing in only the next couple of hours. But thankfully, I do have a fantastic and knowledgeable group of professionals with me tonight. And so um, what I suggest we do is we start off with um, each of the panelists giving a brief introduction about what they do and how they came to doing what they do. Um, we'll then paint the current landscape from each of our your perspectives and um, project our vision of the future and how we see the market grow and change in the coming years. Um, so in the order of appearance, I'll give a little um, introduction to, to the panelists. So uh, Serena Tabaki is an entrepreneur, curator and writer and is the co-founder and director of Museum of Contemporary Digital Art, MOCTA. She's currently researching how to curate digital art exhibitions online and in real life, IRL. Um, Serena regularly writes for The Observer and has curated the past editions of CADAF, Contemporary and Digital Art Fair, alongside the Lumen Art Projects. Um, she is an ambassador for diversity and inclusion at the Blockchain Game Alliance, uh, where she organizes weekly events on art, gaming and blockchain. Serena is also currently developing an art and gaming experience in the Sandbox game and is co-curating a research exhibition project with University College of London in collaboration with Hobbs 3D. Brendan Dawes is a UK-based artist using generative processes involving data, machine learning and algorithms to create interactive installations, electronic objects, online experiences, data visualizations, motion graphics and imagery for screen and print. Time and space are often consistent themes within his work. Illumin Price and Aesthetic Art Price Illumini, his work has featured in many exhibitions across the world, including Big Bang Data in 13 cities, three MoMA shows in New York, together with his Cinema Redux work becoming part of the permanent collection of New York's Museum of Modern Art in 2008. His recent Art of Cybersecurity work is featured at Art Futura 2020. And he's a featured artist at the upcoming .ext group exhibition at Gazelio Project Space, which is the digital arm of Gazeli Art House, um, where he'll produce work that have both a sculptural and um, an NFT component. David Diamond is an artist creating curvaceous, bony, feminine, botanical abstractions in the traditional sculpture medium of alabaster. With his artistic background and having managed a gallery, he understands the challenges for artists in selling work and the pools and tugs of studio creation. In the past decade, he had been steadfast as an avid proponent of digital tech influenced and new media artwork, for he puts forth the view that this is the artwork of a generation and may be the one 
off or the last art movement because of technology itself. Having aggregated a substantial body of this digital and technology related work in the last decade within Aldala collection, the work has been shown in almost 100 museums and exhibitory spaces, as well as galleries worldwide. Diamond has been an art residency juror, a proponent for the land lending of work to major institutions, an advocate for scholarship in this area, and a sounding board in curation, museum acquisitions, and to artists in the creative processes. Ed Pornelis is a British artist living and working in London. His work examines the habits, rules, and protocols of 21st century culture, including the internet, social media, digital economies, and sitcom architecture through which we come to define ourselves and within which our identities are made up and made real. His work comprises installation, sculpture, performance, and video, and has been described as an unsettling reflection. Fornelis has exhibited in a wide range of international institutions, including New Museum New York, Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Schoenkunstale in Frankfurt, Zabudovic Collection, uh, Barbican Art Gallery, Chisholm Hale Gallery, Serpentine Gallery in London, 12th Biennale de Lyon, ZKM in Germany, amongst a few others. He gained his MA in Sculpture at the Royal College of Art and his BA in Fine Art at the Ruskin School of Drawing and Fine Art at Oxford University. Um, so Serena, to kick things off, over to you. Thank you so much, Mila, and uh, thank you everybody for having me on this wonderful panel that I think it's going to look at so many various aspects related to virtual worlds. So as Mila uh, introduced me, I'm the co-founder and co-director of MOCTA, the Museum of Contemporary Digital Art. I'll be sharing my screen now to give you a short introduction around what the museum's activities are and to learn more about our project. So bear with me a moment. And can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. So the uh, Museum of Contemporary Digital Art has been looking at the broader digital arts context from the late 60s until today, looking more specifically into the, the, the movement of uh, crypto art that has been booming from late 2018 uh, to today. Um, what digital art is, just to give a brief introduction, is anything that is described as art that is made or presented using digital technology. Um, the concept has been, as I said, uh, around since the late 60s, but recently with the use AI and blockchain, which I'm sure the other panelists like Brendan will tell you more about this, um, has become way more disruptive and accepted into the art world. Um, our mission is to aid in the discovery and experience of contemporary digital art while working to preserve the knowledge and set the standards for new digital art forms. So we are um, very invested in putting together a permanent art collection that is going to um, essentially bring together a body, bodies, body of works that will be representative of the times we're currently living in um, and, uh, and having them for whoever will come after us in the future. So it's important that we um, make careful selection that is representative of all the movements, including um, the latest one that we're going to talk about today is related to NFT art. So in conjunction to our educational uh, proposition, we're also creating a blockchain-based platform that is going to support the permanent collection and also be of use for artists, collectors and other institutions. Um, some of our latest activities um, and what we do in, in practice, um, we curate and help others curating. So we have a curatorial service for artists and organizations. Uh, we also create limited editions, digital and physical of digital art. Uh, we are also uh, testing a smart contract and we'll be able to license that for art organizations and individuals. And we also have um, created um, an, an art valuation with a mixed approach to including a DAO, which the so-called decentralized autonomous organization that will include curatorial uh, revision, but also include the public in the uh, valuation of the work. 
um, some other activities and how we work essentially in the in public places, but also in uh, in virtual is through uh, a number of events, workshops and exhibitions that we've been taking in real life places, but also virtually um, that we'll explore later on today. Uh, we've also been uh, building strategic partnerships to strengthen our presence in the digital uh, space and also are building a membership model that will include artists and anyone who uh, loves digital art and wants to take an active part in this movement. Um, elements of innovation that we bring to the, the, to the space are smart contracts that will integrate um, will will be an integrative solution for the identification and authentication of uh, digital property. Um, the curatorial team alongside the DAO um, and the business model that we put together as we are um, probably moving forward from the more established museums model and be more inclusive of uh, models that can be in support of initiatives such as this one that can blend physical and virtual together towards a more sustainable way of uh, building education for the future. And further considerations around these are, of course, ethical around the use of blockchain and the consumption that these has been producing. Um, so we're keeping always, uh, you know, looking for uh, resources that can be uh, green in terms of the and eco-friendly in terms of the environment. Um, so we're adopting more green solutions around this uh, that can also support the creation and the, um, the the collection and how these will be stored in the future. And that's what we do at Mokda in a nutshell. Thank you. That's super, super interesting. Thank you so much for this. Just a quick kind of follow on question. Is it, um, uh, do you have a, a time frame set up for um, launching this uh, side of the business of, of um, or of the, of the model um, for authenticating and valuation um, that you've just mentioned? Uh, yes, that's in the that's in the progress. Um, the collection will be part of the collection will go live on the first of June, and most of the other features will will be probably going live around September October. So we're working on it, but it's been like a solid year and a half, two years, I would say, of work. So we're oh we're we're making it live soon. Incredible. So this year this year would be the year hopefully fingers crossed everything will go smoothly um thank you so much for this i think i will um pull up now to the stage brendan hey Mila. uh hello everyone lovely to be here on such a a lovely panel with so many experts i feel kind of out of place but i will uh share my screen as i've got um a loop uh, that i can play while i'm talking away um let me just pull it up okay um my name is brendan Dawes. hopefully you can all you can all see that um my name is brendan Dawes. i'm a i'm an artist um for a long time i kind of had a problem with that word uh i called myself a designer but i realized that no one was asking me to design anything anymore um so uh, I'm not uh, formally trained. I never went to, I left school at 16 uh, with zero qualifications and never went to college or or art school or anything. Um, but I, in 1981, I fell in love with programming and code and the creative possibilities of code. Um, and for me, the ability to type some words into a box and make things happen was really empowering and, and inspirational for me um but i didn't go into coding or anything as a career i ended up uh i had a record contract for a while during the rave scene in manchester in the 90s uh, again because i could i couldn't play an instrument but i could put beats together uh using computers so that's what i did and uh had a had some chart success in New York club scene back in the early 90s, but never made any money. Um, and then because uh, I needed money, I ended up working in a factory and stayed there for eight years, drilling holes in fiberglass. And uh, eventually 
well, you either want to kill yourself or you want to get out. So uh, I decided on the latter. And um, I discovered uh, design and I got a job uh, as a designer. And then, um, but I was always programming and making my own stuff, always interested in art. I was interested in the aesthetics of form and code. And so I would constantly play around with things. And it eventually led to um, get doing a piece that would go into an exhibition in MoMA in New York in 2008, and uh, which then became part of the permanent collection. So I thought maybe there was something in this art thing. Um, and then I was um, creative director of a design agency for a long time. And then I, uh, even though I was still making my own stuff, still exhibiting my own work, uh, my other life was as a creative director, and then I left that in 2012 to really concentrate on, on my own work. So a lot of it was done for clients and uh, big brands all over the world who commissioned me to make work. Sometimes it involves data, though I'm not a data visualizer. Um, so I'm more on the data art side of things. And, uh, and, you know, and now, fast forward to now, um, I got into the whole NFT thing in June of last year, and it kind of went crazy. Um, luckily, I had some of the big collectors collect my work, and I've kind of not looked back, really, and it's kind of been, you know, um, life-changing in, in many ways. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, you know, for me, Computers are part author. Uh, they are, you know, I'm, I, I make systems and um, I want to be surprised by what that system can do, whether that's interaction from another human being or the way the code interacts, and I want it to surprise me. Um, so that's why I love making things with computers. Uh, and sometimes they are most digital, sometimes they're physical, things that might be 3d printed or an electronic objects or whatever but so yeah that's that's kind of me in a nutshell Thank can everyone hear so me Is that okay 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 brilliant thank you Thank you so much, Brendan. Um, this is really interesting kind of background story to how you to how you came into into all of this in in um, for your first. So your first kind of breakthrough moment, I guess, as an artist was was MoMA show. Was yeah, yeah. I, I still remember that day when I got that email. You know, I think it was in 2007. The show was in 2008. And I just got an email through because I, you know, that's the beauty of the internet. You put, you can put your work out there, and this piece had been had existed since two thousand and four. So it took about three years to, you know, get noticed by MoMA. But yeah, that was that was the breakthrough moment for sure. It's amazing. But did it have a physical component as well, or was it a screen based piece? No, it was. A, they actually printed it thirty feet high in the exhibition, so it's it was a giant, you know physical picture wow and yeah. from then the rest is history what's that i'm just waiting to be found out <laughs> so <laughs> well um yeah we'll we'll obviously come back to um to to all the fun things you're up to now um let me uh go to david now um Hi, David. Good morning. Evening. Good morning. <laughs> so tell us, tell us how you how you came up to um, came to 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 being involved or so involved in the digital um, art world. Sure. Thanks so much. First, let's um, let me just say thanks for uh, having me here at Kiblix 2021. It's great to be here, especially with the group of um, panelists that you've put together. I think as I give you a little bit of a flavor today. I'm probably going to approach things a little bit differently than perhaps some of my peers on this um, on the panel. It'll have less of a 
technological um, co component perhaps and maybe my technological aptitude will will show that it it's clearly not as advanced as some of our other panelists but I think I have some perspective and uh, I'll certainly offer it. Uh, let me give you a little bit of a flavor on my background and then I'll tell you how I came to an interest in digital arts. I'm by nature a collector of things. I'm an artist. I work in traditional media, not in technological tools. I have um, an entrepreneurial background. I've built a number of finance and art businesses over the years, and I've helped a number of families put together art collections uh, lately in the, uh, in the digital space, as well as um, helped in the curation of aggregation of works for a number of businesses. I found my way into the digital space by happenstance and by an evolutionary process in the context of how I look at art. Um, like most people, I, I started off um, post-college with an interest in impressionism, post-impressionism, and dabbled a little bit in that area with, with uh, some fortune to be able to acquire some pieces in that area. Uh, over time, migrated to Fauve, German Expressionism, American Modernism, Op Art, and then spent about seven years focusing on the Latin American art market. And then um, by happenstance, I stumbled into digital arts in installing a Julian OP piece um, a number of years ago and realized that perhaps there was a new language and a new form of artwork that was taking hold that spoke more to a contemporary generation and spoke to perhaps the most significant change in the way we all lead our lives. And this part goes back to roughly 2012, 2013, where technology was starting to ramp as an immersive um, component of all of our lives. And if you remember back to that time, there really weren't even, there weren't billboards showing digital media on the side of highways. There were no billboards in supermarkets and restaurants, let alone banks and other service businesses. And the whole notion of digital in invasion of our lives was really in the, in the early stages. So I found myself stumbling into digital media and I reached out to some folks in New York and I said, can you tell me about digital media? And it was very clear there really weren't any venues that I could go to that I had found um, with my relationships to explain what was going on to me, so I reached out to artists on a global basis and pretty much networked to find out and get an understanding of what was going on. And really, as Serena pointed out, while digital tools and digital media has existed since the 60s, it really wasn't until the early 2000s that work was starting to be made perhaps that would fit into sort of a more, home, whether a home or a commercial environment. And I think that started to be an inflection point where galleries started to present the work. So while we're certainly gonna have, have a robust conversation today around how digital media has found its way into our lives, it's very clear if you go back a decade ago that tools were emerging that were allowing artists to explore in different ways. And while uh, the original digital art began, at least in the 90s, the so really not the beginning, but the digital art in the 90s was about the internet and presenting information about the internet. In the 2000s, artists started to expand much more broadly and show and reflect what was going on in society and the capacity for those tools to take us in directions that had really never been explored before by artists in a global context. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of how I got there. Thank you so much. And so would you, I mean, because as you know, from from what you just said and from obviously corresponding with you in the past, um, you kind of wear different hats from, you know, artist, um, collector, obviously, to, I guess you, you do some advisory um, roles as well. To, is it two artists as well? Do you guide some artists through kind of the, the, the creative process of, or, or something? I think as an artist myself, I've been able to build constructive relationships with artists across media and across tools over time. So whether it's spending time virtually as we're doing today or pouring through studios, direct conversations, even in social gatherings, it's constant dialogue around 
the creative process and what artists are doing, not just I'm based in Boston and not just in the Northeast and Boston, New York, but in LA, London, Germany, Australia, pretty much on a global basis. Frankly, digital technology has allowed us to reach out everywhere. So I've had a lot of conversations over the years about everything from the construction to the distribution, to the marketing, all the different facets that would go into an artist making and distributing their artwork. Mm -hmm. And from the kind of collecting point of view, collector's point of view, do you, how, how important is it for you to kind of do these or, you know, attend studio visits or meet the artists in a studio, be it again, virtually or in the real world? Is it, is it something that is kind of a must for you to, to, to know the artist ahead of, you know, making a decision of acquiring a work of his? I mean, it's both aesthetically and intellectually gratifying. In fact, it's an amazing experience. And I think uh, the rest of the panelists, and I'm sure most of your viewers could contend that there's nothing more amazing than sitting across the table from a creative person, whether it's in, you know, the visual arts or music or theater or literature, where they're expounding on their creative ideas and ideology and concepts and bringing those forward and having real world conversations around that. Completely. Okay, well, we're looking forward to um, to to getting your thoughts on on the development of the market generally, on the growth of it, and all the rest, and all the other fun things we have in store for for the audience today. Thank you so much, David. Um, Ed, over to you. Hello. Um, yeah. So I am an artist, and I've worked in the digital in many different guises. It seems over the years. Um, I've actually, like, I know, I remember in art school this moment where almost being able to choose which generation I could belong to, and the sensation that um, if that it was almost like a responsibility to move into the digital to begin occupying that space. I think there's the responsibility for artists generally to um, occupy where people inhabit. You know, what's being used, what's popular. Um, so that's ranged from, I don't know video, virtual reality, uh, large on large performances or spread over social media um, and works that involve a lot of aggregation. Um, I'm just going to show a quick video now that uh, looks at these entities that I've created called Finidia. They uh, live off or respond to data flows. So um, they become happy and buoyant when uh, value is incurred in a data set and they become depressed and sad, physically ill, sick and maybe die if the, the value diminishes too much. Um, but in any case, let's uh, perhaps show the film and we can, I'll talk to you more about it after. Sure. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. you've got it, yeah. What are the artist's intentions with producing the familiar? What is the potential impact of an empathy tool like this? What does it mean to form an emotional bond to abstract structures? Who benefits from this relationship and how? And what, if any, is the emotional fallout? The familiar's existence appears tied to structures outside of the artist or viewer's personal control. Its fate instead is linked to whichever data set it is feeding off. This lack of control becomes tangible when a user is faced with a sick or depressed familiar, unable to correct or alter its state. Furthermore, it is the familiar's state itself that may begin having a direct impact on the user's life. This becomes very apparent in familiar linked to currency or GDP, whose emotional highs and lows may represent the creation or loss of a job. A prolonged frown could point to a major economic decline that will affect millions of people. The cute facade begins to crack, revealing a menacing face. The viewer here also becomes aware that the maintenance and upkeep of the familiar cannot just fall on the singular person, but is the responsibility of many people moving and working together in tandem. The individual is forced to register their powerlessness in relation to these large, unwieldy structures. What does it mean to make this relationship visible? What ends does an empathetic tool like this serve? 
Is it positive to have a relationship with a power structure? Could contact with a familiar result in unwanted stress? The familiars seen from this light take on a dark tone. Possessed of a body, they perform a reversal. By depriving us of our own, seen through their eyes, we become variables, whose main concern is pursuit of value and growth. What is more, it becomes evident that one familiar's happiness and health might result in another's sickness or even death. That as a species, they might even be considered cannibals, engaged in a battle royal with the more successful ones feeding of the weaker. And how then is the viewer meant to judge this ecosystem? Is this suffering avoidable? Or are we witnessing the creatures in their natural habitat, however violent that might be? Hello, and welcome to Fenilia Land, home to the Fenilias. Look, here is one now. He is just waking up. We should be quiet. The Fenilia are a most peculiar species, only recently discovered, and no one knows exactly how or where they come from. Their existence still remains a mystery, but a few facts have been ascertained for certain. It appears that Fenilia, like this little chap, are made out of vast amounts of data. Say hello to Dunop here, shall we? Dunop, how are you this morning? Well, that is sad to hear that. It's okay. Things will be better today, I'm sure. I have heard some very promising rumors that will do you the world of good. No one knows how or why the Fenilia evolved, but they were discovered not so long ago in service across the world. At first, they were considered a rare digital oddity, but soon Fenilia could be found everywhere, all inextricably linked to various pools of data. Everything from companies to road systems to rainfall to football teams. Using a very human interface of facial expressions and body language, the familiar allows us to understand and relate to things that once felt remote and distant. What once was invisible now appears to us in the most delicate, sweetest, cutest form imaginable. You see, Dunop here is connected to the British Pound. It took a while for our boffins to connect the dots and figure it out, but Dunop's mental and physical health appear to be linked to the currency. As it goes up in value, he becomes happy, and as it decreases, he'll begin getting sad, until eventually he will become physically sick. Goodbye, Dunop. Goodbye, Fenilius. We'll see you soon for another exciting day. Hello, I'd like to introduce you to Familiar, a new empathy tool designed to allow a close and intermediate understanding of large and often illegible structures that surround us. The familiar connects any data set, however huge, to a thoroughly cute tiny bundle of joy, whose mental and physical health is at once relatable to. You see the familiar are a revolution in data visualization. Mapping complicated structures onto an interface humans have evolved to read, face, and body language. A first-generation familiar connected to a company will be able to tell you how well they're performing, not in a moment, but a glance. Developed by engineers and designers based in Montreal, the familiar use proportions connected to a newly born human child, which elicit both a sense of parental bonds and responsibility in the viewer. In this initial moment, the company moves from being just a numeric value and brand identity to something more than that, something living, something real. 
The familiar have made their first mark in finance, who have adopted these little critters not just as mascots, but as the fundamental metrics by which investments are made. No longer simply in the pursuit of profit, the trader adopts the position of guardian, nurturing and feeding as they seek investment for the familiar survival and growth. Investors become emotionally entangled, allowing empathetic and financial investments to coalesce. The result of this has been profound, creating stability in markets as the industry seeks to safeguard not just one familiar, but their entire ecosystem. So get your familiar today and become part of the family. You can do this by either choosing one from our extensive catalog of pre-existing familiar or creating your very own. If you have the data stream, we can breathe life into it. Oh, you're in mute. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, that's just one of many projects, but I bring it up just because it's about to be turned into an NFT and we'll be creating these living entities that are feeding off um, financial structures um, and yeah and just navigating what that means and uh, you know th what the interest for me there is that um, um, you know what is it to be financialized what is I think that people don't understand that spending so much time around thinking about finance especially in those environments um, has an effect on the individual and it's perhaps interesting to reflect on that um, and so perhaps this is a way of thinking about this problem. No, absolutely. And, and just so, so, so kind of like, I, I, I get it, the, the NFT, so, so the piece is a kind of Tamagotchi style where as the, the market moves or the, the, the currency fluctuates, the image of the, this, um, uh, kind of figure this, this, this cartoon like shape would that would, would they kind of their, their moods would be affected basically in real time? How would that work? Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, it's moods affected in real time. Essentially, they become this one of manifestation, this embodiment of a particular currency um, that I suppose the collector and whomever can live with. We're also doing it so they can generate children, and so it becomes also like um, an asset class. They can generate their own assets, which then the collector themselves can also begin selling. Um, Excellent. This is fascinating. And this kind of, yeah, nicely leads me to the, to the, to the little kind of background um, uh, about NFTs that I wanted to kick off our discussion with. But just before I do that, is, is this your first NFT or have you done many before? Yeah, I've been very um, skeptical. I don't know, or just I've been looking at what's going on. I think that um, a lot of friends have jumped on the bandwagon and um, it's been important to try to uh, make sense of the environment. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's probably a, a wise, a wise um, decision to make and an approach. But Brendan, Brendan will have quite a few suggestions in a way to make in terms of entering this this fascinating space um should we kick off the the the, the discussion should we have the um all the panelists displayed so so in kind of when we were discussing this um uh you know topic with 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 all the panelists ahead of um ahead of the the the, the live um Obviously, one has to kind of be, I guess, mindful of the fact that, you know, NFT, although albeit being at the forefront of it all today, is only a portion of digital art, generally, or digital art market. Um, avoiding the subject is absolutely impossible. So um, to get that whole kind of NFT discussion, not necessarily out of the way, but possibly good, you know, for it to be a good kind of starting point for us to just generally kind of have, you know, to, to tackle the um, the ins and outs of the digital art, art market today and, and how it's growing and where it's going. Um, I wanted to give a, a bit of a kind of background on the boom and um, obviously again, I know some some of you in the audience might, you know, roll your eyes and say, oh God, not again, not, 
not again, you know, another reference to Beeple sale at Christie's and all the rest of it. But actually, what's interesting, um, which perhaps not many would know, is the um, uh, even before the kind of Mike Winkleman's um, Christie sale, um, the first NFT um, uh, which appeared on the blockchain in 2013 were colored coins. And um, I don't think, again, unless you were kind of involved in the space or, or, or actively conversing with it, you, it hasn't really kind of hit the mainstream. Um, by 2016, the first crypto artwork appeared on the market with the name Rare Peps, um, a type of meme featuring a frog character. And then the following year, in 17, CryptoPunks went mainstream, which was a series of 10,000 crypto arts released in the Ethereum blockchain by John Watkinson and Matt Hall. Um, Watkinson and Hall opted to let anyone with an Ethereum wallet claim a CryptoPunk for free. And then all the CryptoPunks were swiftly claimed and started a thriving secondary marketplace um, where people bought and sold them, which is obviously quite, a, um, I think, an important element of what's going on today is the activity that's going on in the secondary market, which perhaps is not necessarily frowned upon, but definitely it takes much longer to resell an artwork within um, within the kind of traditional, let's say, art market. I know as a gallery, we have um, in our actual terms, and that's a very kind of common practice. Um, if you buy a work from us, we, you know, you, you, you are, um, without it being kind of too, uh, you know, hardcore as far as the wording goes, but you are legally obliged in a way to hold on to the piece for at least two years. So of course that doesn't apply at all in within the the the, the NFT space. And I, I think this is quite exciting, which is something um, I'd love to kind of bring up with, with the panelists. Um, now in 2017, the same year, the first CryptoPunks were released. Another project was launched in the blockchain, which were the CryptoKitties. Um, which kind of had reminded me of, um, I guess, your, your this 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 work that you just shared. Um, and these NFTs were the first digital game that was traded with cryptocurrency. And then we fast forward to Beeple sale of every day is the first 5,000 days, which obviously made Beeple the third most valuable living artist, overstepping Hockney, Koons and Kusama. Um, which is quite a, you know, radical thing to do for some of the artists. So I'm, I'm curious to hear... Um, you know, um, Ed and Brendan's kind of thoughts on that as far as um, the trajectory of an artist goes. Um, and, and again, the, the speed at which one can, as an artist, um, you know, get, get into the limelight, get into the um, kind of ahead of the race, so to speak, without necessarily following the traditional, again, trajectory that, that one would, um, you know, the hoops that, 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 that one would, would, would have to kind of jump over um, in again the, the traditional kind of art market sense but to kick this whole kind of an nft business off um now serena i don't know or david if you want to start off with um just telling us um maybe serena we'll start with you i know david we, we were going to um um kick this whole discussion off with you but let's let's bring serena into this just as a um uh, oh, i'm hearing myself sorry okay um um, in terms of the number of NFT shows that you've curated, um, you've been involved in, 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 you know, talks on this, on, on, on the whole kind of NFTs development for a while, even before it, it, it went um, kind of mainstream. Um, and I'm sure you've been approached, you know, hundreds of times by artists, collectors, helping them to, in a way, kick off their, or, you know, introduce them into this market, into the, uh, you know, specifically kind of, the NFTs, but generally the digital art market. So what has been, in a way, your experience, your advice to these newcomers, in a way, from both artistic and, um, you know, collector side? Thank you for the question, Mila. Yes, um, it's definitely been quite a journey because there's been a, a wave of interest around curating spaces that are virtual. And I think we were probably not as advanced as we are today after spending over a year indoors. Um, and I think this has been a huge um, kind of like fast forward experience for many institutions, galleries and individuals that have tested those virtual environments. But I think there's also a lot of learnings that have been made by all of us. And how we navigate the space has also influenced the way the works are exhibited. 
Um, I think generally there's been a better understanding of the media uh, and how these are um, used and how to better integrate virtual and physical together. And my feedback, my takeaway around the old experience is that probably the virtual experience is going to live alongside the physical one from now onwards. Well, at least that's the feeling I have about this. Um, now, the NFT space has been quite a disruptive movement and it's been incredibly independent. And I think we've seen an initial interest from the artist to just do whatever they wanted to do in a very independent um, in a very independent way. So I don't think there was um, not the necessity, but the interest from third party organizations to get in the way. And I think it's more something that is happening right now because of the volume and because it's very difficult to filter the amount of content that we find online these days that goes under the NFT tag, um, that it's become more and more appealing to artists and people that want to be more visible, to be curated and to be in certain places and being seen in a certain way. Um, so I think that's been a shift towards going back to the work of galleries, museums and curators and how these people have been supporting artists in better conveying the content um, and the stories that, you know, sometimes the work itself um, struggles to, 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 to reach the public. Um, so I think there's been, uh, you know, an initial movement where art was projected mainly on social media, virtual rooms have been created, often without following the actual um, sense of how the flow of the audience naturally goes in a physical location, but it was just a rush towards putting works online because it was a necessity and most places were shut during you know, the pandemic. Now as things are reopening, I think people are adapting and keeping virtual galleries and public galleries open at the same time so that people that are still unable to travel and so the, the fact that we can keep this space as accessible uh, to all as possible it will it will stay and it will be more accepted um, by the artists, by the audience, and you know, by galleries and institutions, and it will be a given in the future. So, so in a way, do you think kind of having these um, uh, not limitations, but these kind of guidelines, almost, or or having more curated content, is that something that should be, in a way, kind of driven by the marketplaces themselves, or as you mentioned, kind of galleries, curators, museums, wh who are also quite actively kind of trying to get into this space as well? Or is it mainly, do you think time will show, you know, uh, will kind of sift through good NFT work uh, versus a bad one? Um, I think marketplaces are doing a good job, but I also think that at the beginning, um, everyone was welcome to test the technology. And so uh, there were lots of NFTs being minted. And now the artists that were lucky enough to be present in this world in 2018 and early 19 um, had a good chance to, to kind of um, pay the way to, to what has currently happened and what the scene is today and they've been extremely successful mainly because of luck and the intuition that this was going to be an extremely successful movement. But people that didn't have that kind of luck or didn't have that intuition and are joining the space right now, they will find it extremely uh, difficult to access. Um, and that puts a very high entry barrier because the gas fees that are you know, used to do the minting, um, it's quite expensive. Um, there's a lot of learning that you have to have under your hat if you want to join a marketplace right now. Uh, probably now is way more accessible than it was a while ago, but still there's a bit of learning that needs to happen there. Um, and platforms are having <laughs> huge, you, you know, they're in huge demand. So they have tons of applications um, coming through every month that it's becoming very challenging for an artist to be seen and to be accepted on those marketplaces. So a few of them are still free and there's no vetting system, but most of them now are. 
So I think the the filtering or the curatorial, it's becoming more and more important. But I don't think that this movement, which was born out of like freedom <laughs> from the artist, you know, should change because I think that's in the spirit of the movement itself. Um, so it will be interesting to see if this will become another exclusive uh, face or if it's going to stay open as it was at the very beginning. Absolutely. And I think I think we're having some um, slight issues with with uh, David, but he'll hopefully rejoin us in a sec. Brendan, of course, you've you've mentioned, um, you know, you've you've been in the space for the past year, which is, you know, quite early on. Um, what has been, I guess, your your experience in terms of this kind of curation being associated with specific platform over the over over another? Because you are present on, on, on quite a few kind of key marketplaces from, you know, Nifty Gateway to um, Maker's Place to obviously OpenSea. What was your, what, what's been kind of what, yeah, what, what was your experience like? Um, I think, yeah, um, initially I was approached uh, by Nifty Gateway very early on last year. Um, I think I'd only done one thing on Known Origin and they, they got in touch with me and it was back when no one had really heard of Nifty Gateway or you know, <laughs> it was just another platform, wasn't it? Um, what, what was interesting for me, I guess, is the reason Nifty Gateway exploded was because, well, one of the reasons was because they accepted US dollars as payment. So, you know, Serena was saying about that making things accessible is that barrier for entry was, you know, it had come down, you know, you didn't need a what, because when I was first getting into it and David from Known Origin had, I'd, you know, for for over a year, had been asking me to get involved, and finally I said, "Oh, go on, let's have a look at this thing." Um, you know, there's this kind of grammar that you needed was perceived that you needed to know, or you already knew, like a wallet and a a, a Genesis piece, and I had no clue what any of this was. You know, so there's this perception that you need you, you know it, and of course you don't. And I'm and I'm quite geeky, so. Um, I think that's where Nifty Gateway were very clever. They they realized that actually to get more people to buy into this, we need to not worry about wallets and things. Now, you know, the crypto art purists will say, you know, it's, it's always got to be on chain and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that will always split people. But, you know, the, you've got to admit that was kind of clever and why they were so, so successful. Um, but, yeah, it's... <laughs> And then, of course, it then brings a sort of cachet about being on a certain platform, rightly or wrongly, by the way. You know, it's it, it's kind of ironic, I guess, that this is a very democratic or could be a very democratic movement, but we're already seeing, you know, kind of gatekeepers and, you know, that everyone wants to be on Nifty Gateway. Well, not everyone, but, you know, They've they've closed the applications. You, you just can't get in there now uh, for a while, um, and and then we can have another discussion about, you know, how open editions have fallen off a cliff, um, you know. So all those kind of things. So the market is constantly changing, and how people and the secondary market as well has kind of you know flattened off for the time being, you know, in a very short space of time, really. Um, so I think you know, for me, I've tried to. I always say I'm not in any hurry. I'm just, I've got, you know, 25 years of work that I could just bombard these platforms with and mint every day. It just doesn't interest me at all because I'm, I want to try and make, you know, the best work that I can and release stuff that actually means something. So um, I'm not being kind of, you know, I think there's some people that have been greedy and there's, you know, there's, we've seen celebrities come in who, don't interact with their community at all and they, you never hear from them again and they do a big cash grab and you know the community calls them out though you know so very quickly it's you know it, there's no way back for them up sometimes so yeah it's a very it's a very interesting ecosystem one that I'm still managing to try and figure out um but it's it's also very exciting and and it's you know it's it's optimistic I, that's what I I love about it as an artist it's like so hang on a minute rather than just put stuff on instagram you can 
you know, and I already was in galleries, of course, you know, traditional galleries and had relationships with galleries, you know, that in the traditional world. There's also something to else to mention as well is there's probably a bit of a sense of irony that it's still a big deal when an auction house, traditional auction house goes, we want you to do an NFT. So, you know, yeah, we've got this incredibly new movement, but actually what people, it's a big news if one of, you know, Christie's or Sotheby's or Phillips go, we want you to do an auction. So that maybe says, so it, and the physical side as well, it's the same thing as, um, you can think of traditional auction houses in the same way people still, gravit there's gravitas to physical things. So if you write a book, that's a way bigger deal than writing a website. So it's, you know, in people still now in the, the culture of now, you know, writing a book or being involved in a book is a big deal for people in the streets. I'm talking, I mean, the general public. Um, so all these, all these things are really interesting to me. You know, you've got this modern thing, but we've still got this traditional world that we still hold on to. So yeah, it's, it, it's, to me, it's completely really fascinating. Completely. And I think in terms of, cause you mentioned the idea of community as well, and that's such a word that 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 really started to kind of pop up time and time again when one was talking about this whole um i guess movement and this this takeover so to speak of the nfts and 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 i wonder if and and you know the idea that it's all decentralized and the idea that you know some of these platforms and i don't know if that's already something that's happening but there was a talk at some point to make it um you know kind of voted in terms of applications that are being processed by artists by some of these marketplace platforms um uh, it, it's almost kind of a voting system of sorts that that you know allows you to be essentially part of this community and generally in terms of you mentioned the auction houses of all these incredible sales that are happening um you know record-breaking sales um you know one does think how many people are involved in this in this market uh, in terms of actually kind of feeding the market the, from the collector's point of view um supporting just a select few of artists and how wide is that um uh, outreach is as far as you know on the one hand you do have that inclusivity of um or accessibility of you know it's open to all as far as setting up a wallet goes and the kind of technicalities that are involved in buying um uh, nft based art um but then on the other hand it's it's almost you still need to be in a way part of that community to not necessarily get insiders tips but to kind of understand what the hell you're doing because there's always yeah. that complete you know kind of what the hell is 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 going on again going back to the quality of the work and and um and what is reaching these high price tags um as far as the quality of the artwork goes and of course you know the the quality generally it it's not based on the um in, in a way the traditional parameters that one would have when assessing a work whether it's you know the number of hours that went into it it's it's just from a from kind of the the the, the um uh, outsiders in a way point of view it's it's difficult to assess what exactly is you know, I mean, obviously, aesthetics aside, what exactly is um, not necessarily good or bad um, NFT based work, but what uh, justifies in a way a, a high um, uh, priced piece. Um, and I wondered if you kind of, again, going back to that, because I'm curious as well in terms of your background as a traditional artist in a way, um, you know, graduating from RCA and having that kind of background and then obviously diving into the digital space and now into the NFT space, the, the speed again at which at which it's picking up for some of the artists, is that something that really annoys you or you kind of embrace it and you're, you know, why the hell not kind of attitude? I mean, I think we need to be clear that we're talking about the creation, birth and momentum of cultures. Yes, there is the technological aspect to it, um, but like, you know, as you mentioned, I went to art school, which is something that you'll find most artists that I meet have. And what that means is you end up ideologically being signed into a system uh, which has galleries, 
certain kinds of gatekeepers, etc. And then over there, somewhere else, in the tech community, in the gaming community, in other online spaces, um, something else has happened. Um, and it's super interesting to me. I think the the people sale, the NFT culture generally has something is closer to GameStop uh, than it is to the conventional art world. I think that um, those sales prices essentially are about um, it's it's anti-institutional to a large degree. It's it's kind of saying fuck you to the traditional art world. Um, and yet at the same time, it's using the, some of the tools and devices like auction houses. So that's kind of interesting. And, but now there's a sense of uh, how, what will happen in terms of the art world. You know, people are making digital work forever and um, no one has really bothered looking at it much or, um, I mean, yes, there has been some momentum perhaps in like the 2000s and it is part of our, the, you know, art world environment um, to a degree. I think what NFTs have done is they've turned digital work into paintings. You know, paintings for such a long time have been treated as just assets. They are assets you put on walls and can store in like, you know, temperature controlled uh, storage in, in Switzerland. It, you know, they are, they're not, their artiness essentially has um, been drained in in exchange for this uh, finance uh for want of better words. Um, and yeah, I don't know. And so I suppose it allows digital work to operate in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. No, that, that makes sense completely. I know. Um, so we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I can I can run through it. Now we do, we do, um, we will be tackling them later in the in the in the discussion as well. But we might as well bring it up now because I think Serena, you have to head out soon, and we're having issues with bringing back David into the conversation. But hopefully, he should be here soon. So um, we can go through. Uh, generally, I guess that that's a relevant kind of segue to how do we think um, uh, the digital market will affect the collecting in general. That's one of the questions that came in. I don't know, Serena, if you want to tackle that. Sure. Um, it's interesting to see how these has already been influencing the general collecting. And I see there's um, much interest from more traditional collectors in wanting to understand what those NFTs are and how to collect them. Um, I think there's still a lot of uncertainty because of the volatility of the crypto and how to invoice an NFT as well, and how to make it, uh, you know, um, a, a formal sale, you know. And uh, again, around the IP and copyright of the NFTs. So all these gray areas still remain, um, uh, you know, uh, something that a collector would question. And unless you are unless you are somebody who is into the crypto world and really believes in that, I think you would probably um, you know be interested, but uh, not rushing to it. Um, so I think until those things, those points get cleared, and I think those will probably be clearer to everyone in the next six months or so, um, I think there's going to be a little friction between the more traditional collecting system and mm. the crypto space. But the gap is closing. <laughs> so I can see these happening every day. Um, in the sense, uh, like how this has been influencing, I mean, from my perspective, I think um, there's, been, there's been a ramp up in what NFTs value uh, has been over the past six months, like we've seen just you know, going it all the way up and now it's stabilizing it a little bit more. Like we see April that has been uh, like March, April, the, the, it's been skyrocketing and now it's just going back to something that is, you know, already uh, like April, May, they look slightly more normal, I would say, or, or um, the expected value of NFTs is becoming at least there's an average price that we can put on it. 
Um, the influence that these had on um, collecting on um, the normal collection, I think, um, is that prices have gone up and nobody were expecting this during the pandemic. And I think galleries and um, um, mainly galleries and artists that were trading that work um, struggled to price that work compared to the NFT market. Because uh, the NFTs market has just been above everyone's expectation. Um, and so everyone else, I think, struggled to put a price on that work or at least put it on the market. And I think this has been, you know, kind of like shaking up the system, which is now going back to a more um, stable um, and, you know, kind of like going back to what the expectations were. Still, the, the fluctuation of crypto is uh, difficult to predict. So I think there's a lot of interest, um, still a lot of gray areas, uh, but once those will be finding answers, I think they will be um, probably reaching a point where an average NFT price will have an amount that we would be more familiar with. And that's actually quite an interesting kind of um, point about pricing and, and you know, and again, the traditional um, kind of art market, I guess, um, or art world, you'd have a, a pricing of a work as a discussion between the artist and the gallerist or dealer. And, you know, that's something that I think um, a gallery or a dealer has quite a, a significant input in. Now, you know, the, the interesting observation with all the, with everything that's been happening is the removal of that middleman and 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 the need in a way of of the gallery or that structure or the infrastructure. Um, so Ed, Brendan, I guess to both of you, um, how have you been pricing your works, or, or have you have you sought any kind of advice from in terms of NFTs or or um, well, beginning with NFTs, starting with NFTs, but generally. Um, I guess other works as well. Is that something that you've had some advice on from from the kind of market or the gallerists? Uh, shall I shall I start? Ed? Um, no, I, I don't know if I've had any advice. I think I've just been driven by the you know in some way trying to navigate the market. I think um, you know making sure that um, people can. Well, I guess I, I've, <laughs> I've got my creative di ex creative director head on. One of my heroes is is uh, is Tom Ford, who was <laughs> you know when he when he joined Gucci, he was uh, he had this idea that anyone could buy into the brand um, at different levels, uh, which I thought was always you know just a, a clever. It's a very commercial thing to do, but you know you could buy a a Gucci perfume for forty quid, but you, you know you. A couture Gucci dress is, you know, tens of thousands. So you know, you but well, you can buy into the brand at, at different levels. So it's kind of clever. So I think that's what's been interesting with what I've enjoyed. Some of my stuff is is pricing in that way. And I know because it, it, it brings in new collectors, you know, who don't have you know a, a several thousand to spend. Um, so that that's quite nice. And then you know they've got a piece of your work. Um, but then you also have to be driven by um, the market, and I thought, you know, and the curveball, of course, is the price of Ethereum. And there's this discussion that goes on constantly, as I'm sure you've seen, is that does an artist, usually with an artist, you know, having this internal discussion and on Twitter, it's like, do I price in US dollars or do I price, you know, I priced in three Ethereum, and when it was two hundred dollars per Ethereum and now it's like $3,000, do I reduce my Ethereum price or, you know, it's, and, and for me, I'm like, I, I just stick to the, you know, a piece was five Ethereum a year ago, it's five Ethereum now, you know, that's, you know, that that's my take on it um, because the work is still five Ethereum, you know, when you sell it on, it's, you know, that's how the market works. But so yeah, and, and and also talking with collectors as well. Yeah, definitely have those discussions, and and you know, um, watching the the Discord channels about, oh that work was really expensive. You know, 
thankfully I've not had that, but trying to see what other people are saying about other people's work and, you know, and, and it, at the end of the day, it's all about scarcity. Collectors love one of ones, ultimately. Um, you know, so you price a one of one very differently to, you know, a one of 20 or, you know, of course you do. So, um, but that's, you know, I don't think that's anything new. That's gone, you know, that's how the traditional art market went. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm still monitoring it really and speaking to, and also I wanted to mention from before, I know for a fact that collectors of NFTs are mentoring big name traditional art collectors. Uh, and I know, I know that is actually happening day to day. A really big people with lots of money make collecting, you know, the, the Basquiat's of this world. They are having discussions with people who collect NFTs. So, and, that, and that's happening all the time. So, you, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't think they're doing that just for a laugh. I think they're doing it for a, you know, for a reason. So that, that's interesting as well. No, absolutely. I think that's actually quite an interesting observation there, or well, not observation, but a, um, an insight. Um, a lot of, I would imagine, at any uh, kind of entry point from, again, an artist or a collector's point of view, you do need that almost hand-holding, right? And if that's something that, especially at a certain level, um, where, you know, large funds are are, are being put into 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 this this kind of space you like yeah i can i can see how you know it's crucial to in a way have that um that introduction by someone who actually you know has been collecting for a while and has is is extremely kind of well versed in in um in all of this um i think from a collector's there was actually an interesting um article which i think was in the new york times on over the weekend, it was a few days ago, where there was um, uh, it was it was by Albert Laszlo Barabasi, um, and he he's got a lab, and he basically um, uh, scanned super rare transactions um, over the past three years, um, so from April eighteen to April twenty one, and so he's he's kind of mapped out. Um, the not only the, the 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 number of transactions that happened, but also he kind of um, tackled the primary and the secondary market on the platform, and most interestingly, the number of collectors that were involved in on the primary market front purchasing. I think it was over um, uh, what was it, sixteen thousand or something artworks, um, and then and then uh, on the secondary market. Um, front as well how many kind of of these or how many collectors were involved in in those secondary market transactions and and there was a really interesting um discovery kind of an eye opener that only two collectors specifically were mainly involved in the secondary market um and that's only super rare so that's you know granted it's not kind of an overview of the whole market generally but it does give a sense you know going back to 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 what we were talking about is how wide does that outreach go in a sense not necessarily kind of interacting with the work and having that accessibility but in terms of actually buying and actually you know being involved in that transaction um on again you know primary and secondary market basis and 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 having that um uh having kind of a, a an exposure to a wider group of collectors that are willing to support artists you know um, beyond those that are in this field already go on it well i'm just saying that i think what you're seeing here is a lot of people who become very crypto rich you have a bunch of whales with a lot of wealth and a lot of those people are motivated ideologically for getting into that space they believe that crypto could change the world there's i know a lot of them anarcho capitalists a lot of them are trying to build and use infrastructure that is predominantly crypto. And so one thing I think we're seeing is whales spending money to try to uh, force the meme, to like force this crypto reality into existence. 
And when you spend $70 million on a JPEG or a GIF, that, that you do that to a certain extent. They, they've, they, they've done a very good job at it. And I think that, um, yeah, so a lot of, the, there's no, it's not surprising to me that there are only two collectors on the secondary. I think that a lot of what you're seeing as well is market manipulation, um, but a market manipulation with an objective in mind, you know, um, as I said, to try to create this sort of crypto reality um, and to generate a culture which these things um, can be bought and sold. And I think they've proven that, that it is it is doable. Um, as to what the tone and nature of that reality is, is another question. I mean, it's kind of crazy in the sense that when you know when you're existing within a crypto reality, everything is an asset. Everything is something that that can produce profit or gain. And obviously, like art is specifically being looked at in that way. They've looked at traditional art structures and be like, that's that's an interesting idea. We can do that. Um, but it's interesting because it it, it it forefronts the asset over what the conceptual or thematic artwork actually might be or could be. And like you don't really see much of a um a discourse or intersect or connection between um the the, the yeah the language that you'd use to describe uh, art that you'd perhaps see in the contemporary art world and what's been produced in the crypto space. I mean you could not put people in the 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 sort of the content would be shot down so quickly. Um, th there's no space for the kind of imagery that people has produced within the contemporary art world um, for various reasons. I don't know if that's uh, bad to say that, but I think I might be right. I mean, I didn't listen to it annoyingly, but um, Jordan Wolfson uh, was on a podcast with him recently. And they went into this apparently. What the, the the quality of the work? More like so. I mean, you're talking about a discourse that's been created that you know is distributed probably between New York, London, Paris, Los Angeles, and a couple of other places. That, as I said before, derives mainly from an art history, art school. It's like an ongoing discourse. What people people got chosen almost at random. He is a bit a tool. He is a political tool being used by people to try to, as I said, generate a world, like a way of thinking. Um, and it is, it probably is in radical opposition to the world that's been generated in the art space. I mean, there is a political dimension to this, where you have uh, perhaps a more reactionary register of politics in tension with a more liberal register of politics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in, in, in a way, just in terms of, I guess we, we touched on it earlier, it, the, the, the need for the quality of work to be kind of dictating its success in a way, its market success, is that something you, you, you'd say you kind of stand by, or you think there's still kind of room in the space to have um, outliers and, and you know, pleasant surprises where the work that doesn't necessarily fit into, for whatever reason, in the traditional world, in the traditional art world, um, it it can still do extremely well in 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 this in the digital space. Yeah, I mean, artwork that is that is built for the digital space is more likely to be successful financially in the digital art space because it's talking to that particular audience. But I do think, yeah, there there can be surprises. And I think we're in this very first early, tiny, tiny moment, and there will become a bleeding of spaces. Um, groups will sort of form, aesthetics will develop, di specific discourses that started online um, will find a connection to this more traditional art world, or they'll remain completely separate and become their, own, you know, exist as their own ecosystem. I think when people speak about the art world, they're making a mistake. There are many worlds built inside worlds, built inside worlds. And um, and each one of them has a possibility of survival, of you know, of, and of growing.
Mm-hmm. Um, and Brendan, actually, a nice kind of um, segue into a question that, that we've received from the public. Um, is now one of the wonders that you can do um, is to bridge digital, virtual to traditional real world and vice versa. Price and art is subjective, build the market, then viva la market rise. Sorry, what was the question? That's a good. I was hoping you you, you would grasp the question from that. <laughs> I, <was hoping. laughs> I guess you're. I guess you're. Um, the way you're kind of in in between this 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 digital, virtual, and traditional and real world. Um, how do you navigate? You know, being present. That's that's how I'm interpreting it. And apologies if that's not the, what you've meant in the audience. Um, but but how how are you kind of um, navigating these these two separate worlds? I guess, um, uh, yeah, and, well, and I, building. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if I distinguish the two really because I, I don't I don't make crypto art and I don't make NFT art. Um, I just try and make the best work that I can around you know that has a as a concept or something I want to say. Um, so it's, I don't think, oh, this one's for the traditional world or this one's, you know, it's, it's just a thing. Um, so it just so happens that the mechanism at the moment that where I'm distributing the work is the NFT world. Um, you know, I, I would never use the term crypto art myself because I think that conjures up as a, as a, as baggage, as a weight that is like, oh, here's a picture of the blockchain you know, block, uh, a Bitcoin icon or something. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, it, I, I think the um, what I'm just trying to do is trying to make the, the best work I can. And, and at the moment, the, the mechanism for delivering that um, in order to, you know, earn a living from it as well, outside of, you know, the, the commissions I get, is, is NFTs. Um, now, you could say that, it's not just about you know creating a JPEG or whatever. It's it's also about the technology that NFTs can bring. Now you can incorporate that as you know an, or a live stuff like Ed is doing with a you know the, the the monetary structures and bringing that in, which is you know really interesting. So that's where digital art is. You know that kind of stuff cannot be done any other way. Um, yeah, I'm not talking about NFTs. I'm talking about digital digital work that is live. Um, you know that's that's always really interesting. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's going to continue to grow. Um, yeah, so it's I don't know. I, I guess I just don't distinguish between the two. And that's probably um, kind of the right way to go about it because I guess the more distinctions that we make, the more difficult it becomes to join the, the you know two or the many worlds like Ed was saying that there are out there. Um, which I, I assume is the intention, certainly is the intention, intention for us here um, at the galleries to cross, cross over, um, I guess, that, that, that separation in a way and really treat it as just an extension, whether it's, you know, an, a, a digital show or, or, or an online and digital work that it's, is, is being displayed in the physical space. I think there's something to say about that. Um, yeah, extension of, of space, extension of um, an artwork or um, extension of, an, of a collection. Um, in terms of collaborations, that's something I wanted to, to ask you both. How, I guess, within, uh, not necessarily specifically, again, NFT space, but, um, but NFTs as well, are you open to it, collaborative kind of projects from, you know, creatives not necessarily within the arts from the fashion and the music um worlds how how what's your what's your take on it and do you think there's more kind of appetite for these type of collaborations now in light of this kind of boom within the digital um art scene yeah well i'm certainly fielding a lot of emails from um agencies or nft agencies that didn't exist yesterday and now they're an nft agency and you know they've got these celebrities and they want to find a, an artist to do some work for and it's a lot of it is just about the money they're not really they don't really care what it is you know and and 
And then, the, you know, and not with me, but I've seen people where the percentages are so terrible. You know, it's like, here's 10% for the artist and the celebrity gets 90%, you know, whatever. Um, so I'm seeing more of that. The collaboration for me is where it's interesting is the collaborations, for instance, I've got on at the minute is um, one with a, a an Oscar-nominated composer and an amazing royal ballet choreographer that, you know, these that's where it's opened up for me the the nft you know people have got in touch and and these are people really at the top of the game and and are really you know brilliant um and equally you know other collaborations that i've got uh lined up um i don't personally you know i've also been asked about collaborating with someone who does similar work to me and i'm like i don't know what the collaboration would be you know it's like you know, you you do, you know, you you program with code, you know, what are we going to do? You know, it's it's kind of, so the collaborations for me are interesting, whether it's a musician or a dancer or a film director, which is another one you know, I'm, I'm, we're working on. So that's where it's interesting. That's where it's, uh, I think, really inspirational for me is working with these people that are all over the world. And, you know, um, it's, it's opened a lot of doors in, in that way. But it also has to be about, they, they want to make beautiful things. They don't. If they if they come to me and say, "I want to make a million, you know, I, I've had really bizarre conversations with people who just want to make money, yeah. and the phone goes down very quickly. Um, so it just has no interest for me. You know, it has to be about the creative products, products in a, you know. Some may say product's a dirty word, but, you know, it's the creative output. It's it's all about that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Ed, are you, because obviously you've kind of, you've most, not most of your projects, but quite a few of your projects are collaborations already. So you're very much in that kind of collaborative spirit when you work. Um, is that something that has, you know, even kind of grown further with, with all the developments and growth that have been happening in the digital world or... Or are, are you finding the more um, kind of focused, i.e. just your input, the better it is? Oh, you're on mute, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so um, collaborative work. I mean, to me, like I think uh, I was most attracted to the digital because of its collaborative uh, capacity. Like one of the first works I made was um, a performance that was played out over social media, over Facebook, with you know 34 people over three months. You know you can't do that in the same way. It was very difficult to do that in the physical realm. Um, and so I think that technology is often um, creating different possibility spaces for collaboration. I mean, I think with crypto, what's interesting is the like the voting mechanisms like voting rights um within DAOs and contracts which potentially could allow for some experimentation in in democracy um or in some other kind of collaborative mode um so yeah i think that is something i would like to uh experiment um and then also for Nidio, i suppose as a gesture is putting itself into the world and is sort of completed by the uh, the brutal participate financial participation in these markets and in these spaces. Um, I don't know if I'd call that collaborative though. It's something else. And then in terms of just general kind of creatives from, I guess, other fields, whether it's um, film or fashion or music is there anything coming up that you're kind of working on now or or will be looking you know, yeah i'm uh, making a, a film about uh sex dolls that uh come to life and they're having a, a sort of um support group meeting uh and discussing what it's like to be objectified and that's going to be fun i'm working with like um uh like puppet like puppeteers so it's all going to be puppeted essentially and then voiced separately. Um, so that's going to be a strange form of collaboration. I've never really worked with um, puppeteers before. 
that'll be incredible. And what the sex dolls actually created specifically, presumably the, the final piece would be a, a film or, or a video work, or is it? Yeah, the, the final piece would be, a, would be a film, exactly. Um, yeah. And, and are the dolls being created specifically for the, for the piece or it's existing dolls already? So there's a huge yeah, so there are, um, yeah, there's a whole world of sex dolls, which is um, strange and beautiful and kind of disturbing all at the same time. Mm. Uh, so I've, there's one that's been crafted in the studio, which is made out of DIY stuff. It's, it's, it, it's like really quite rank. And then uh, there's um, other ones which are hyper, they're beautifully made. They're like made out of silicon, they're very realistic. And then we have another one, which is like in the fantasy of a child, which is sort of a kid's sewn like um, fabric doll. Um, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be, that's gonna be fun to make, I think. And will you be converting it to, into an NFT or a part of it? Uh, I don't think there's a digital side to this, but uh, you know, uh, anything is possible. Mm. As I said, with NFT stuff, I really, or I suppose with crypto stuff, I, I think um, a large social structure that involves voting rights could be something interesting to play with. Mm. As as an artwork. Yeah. Um. Excellent. I'm just looking through the um, through the other questions that we have. Um, There's stuff about going green on here. Um, there you go, environment. That's Brendan, it. Do you have a, a green, like? Yeah. What is your feeling about the carbon consumption stuff? Oh, no. I was on mute. Sorry, Ed. Was that to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. um, yeah, it's there's obviously a lot of misinformation out there as well, on, uh, probably on, on both sides. Um, I think what's happening with uh, I never know how to pronounce it, Hickey Nunk. <laughs> um, they, you know, it's a proof of stake blockchain. Um, there's some really amazing stuff on there, and I, I've done some stuff on there. Um, I think it's obviously a concern that. Um, you know, is is going to be addressed? I think. Um, what's interesting? I think the problem is with Twitter, especially. It's not a place for nuanced debate. And I do know people who've had death threats, and you know, it's it's really kind of insane um, when some people, you know, are just trying to <laughs> trying to make beautiful pieces of work. Um, but I think it, what it has done, it has. Um, brought it to the to the forefront of attention um you know because of i guess the transparency of the blockchain that's the irony of it um i think there was a stat that um youtube the ethereum network uses 0.02 well nfts is 0.02 of what youtube uses a year so you know it's but no one really goes on about how outrageous it is to upload a a cat video um because you know there's no transparency there you can't you can't measure it as you know on, on a day-to-day -day basis um so yeah i i think it's um it's uh, you know it's not it's not going to go away and it needs to obviously improve and and things like hickey nunk and that kind of thing it's definitely the way it's going to go and proof of stake um ethereum 2 is going to is going to help with all that i don't know what, what what's your feelings on it yeah, uh, much the same um, in that, like, you know, there is in the pipeline stuff is going to change with Ethereum too. Um, and it is a relatively small, like people need to question the other use of the internet that is also hugely wasteful. I, it is tricky. I mean, obviously NFTs are Ethereum based and there are other also technologies like Polkadot, um, and other uh, proof of stake stuff that is has already solved that problem, um, but I, I do think that in terms of currencies, Bitcoin is somewhat a disturbing state of affairs, and some of hopefully some of the momentum will be taken out of that. But that's separate from art world stuff. Um, 
What's well, there a I few initiatives? It's... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, go on. Oh, there's a few things that um, friends are working on from crypto space that are interested in buying land uh, and like rewilding it, for instance, um, and creating financial products based off like the carbon offset and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know about the logistics, how it's going to work, but I I do like the idea of rewilding in general. So I'm kind of attracted to it. That's another kind of, um, as you were saying, I was just thinking at at what point is it an artist's kind of responsibility in a way, or how do you both feel in a sense of kind of making decisions and the support that you provide to certain platforms or or have the kind of the the works um, being bought through Bitcoin or whatever it is? Um, Do you feel, do you feel that especially kind of now, are you how responsible in a way does does an artist need to be in their approach to all of the kind of environmental um, questions that are coming up, or is it something you know art needs to exist regardless of of uh, these discussions and let 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 others kind of deal with it in terms of your engagement with these with these really kind of difficult questions? I guess is that something you feel is important? I mean, it's weird. We're responsible, what, as consumers? We're responsible as like active agents in the world. We're all sort of responsible and not responsible at the same time. Um, and I think that I don't know. And the best you can do is sort of point in the right direction. I mean, I think, you know, um, as Brendan was saying, that like at least Ethereum has a, a kind of a plan, a way out, um, in a way that a lot of other kind of spaces don't. Like you don't see. Uh, people being like, oh yeah, we're just let's should we stop art fairs from now on? Um, I think that would be a good idea because you know that has its problems as well. Um, and ironically, they have been stopped due to COVID, but uh, for a moment. But I'm pretty sure they're going to ramp straight back up when we get out. Mm. And Brendan, Brendan, do you do you have some kind of thoughts on that? Just general kind of, I guess, social responsibility as far as an artist goes. Well, yeah, I think we all have to, you know, these days it's 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 a responsible thing to do, you know, ever since, you know, you look at, you know, Blue Planet when it did the whole plastic bag things and everyone was like, oh my God, you know, it's like plastic bags, you know, no one really, it takes a cultural moment that is on the BBC for people to go, okay, and then, you know, now, you know, using a plastic bag is like, you know, it's really, you know, people look at you, you know, it's, and it's, so it was a whole whole movement that, that did a world of good. And I think probably there's going to be a, a moment like that, maybe. I think what people tend to forget is people's personal circumstances. You know, it's like, you know, from... You've got to say, you know, the the, the money side is obviously a, a, a nice thing. You know, let's not, you know, deny that's that's happening. You know, it provides a nice life for you if you can make money off art. Um, and you know, and the other platforms aren't aren't there on on that in that way with regards to the the, the kind of money you can earn. But um, yeah, it's it, you know, I'd be an idiot to say, oh no, I don't, I don't really care about that that kind of stuff I think it's you know it has to you have to kind of navigate it um you know it's in my way I'm not minting every week or month or you know I'm just trying to mint the best work that I can so I I limit it that way you know and then you can say oh well you can carbon offset and then there's like massive critics of carbon offsetting saying it's absolutely bogus and doesn't work other people say it does work you know so it's it's a minefield, you know, it, it really is. It's, you know, and as I say, Twitter is not the place to, to have that nuanced um, or at least civil civil debate, really. Um, so it can be problematic. Um, all I do is try and concentrate on, you know, I can only fit so much stuff in my head. And so it's, you know, it's, I have to concentrate on trying to create the best work that I can. And and hopefully when Ethereum 2 comes out and, you know, I, I always think at the start of a movement, it's noisy. It's it's messy and noisy and not perfect. And people need to understand that. Um, 
and we will get there, you know, and, you know, and, and the noise will decrease and we'll get to a, 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 a hopefully a simpler, better, better, better place to be able to do this. But you, you've got to start, start somewhere and, some, and a lot of the times it's often messy. Mm. But it's 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 absolutely it's it's a very kind of I guess positive note to 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 start wrapping up our discussion on in terms of you know the mess will subside and 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 whatever I guess stays the the, the structure that stays the ecosystem that that will develop out everything out of everything that's going on right now um, would be you know a, a prospering one a, um, a solid one. And definitely, it's an exciting time to to be living through. I think before before I guess you know I go over to um, to to give you the, the the chance of giving any kind of final final remarks that you might have. Um, just a quick logistics thing is is preservation. And I know you know as as again a gallery that has been working with VR works for the past five years. Um, time and time again and it's a shame again david um uh, uh, and serena um uh, aren't with us now but um it, time and time again the 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 questions that have been coming up from the from our collector side was preservation is how do we you know ensure and I, and and that's something that i suppose applies to um well, actually, does it apply to NFT based works um, is, is, you know, in five years time, 10 years time, what does a collection look like um, if someone is actively buying um, uh, NFT based works now? Do you guys have any advice to collectors, artists who, who perhaps are exploring this? Um, I think the, the preservation of digital artifacts has been a, a thing that people have been wrestling with for many, many years. If we go back to the multimedia work of Antirom, who then were, became Tomato and, you know, famous design company, a lot of the kind of important work can no longer be played apart from on a specific Macintosh. And you have to go to a physical place and they put the CD-ROM in and they can play it. So, but otherwise you can't watch, you can't, and yeah, you could make a video of it, but then you, you can't interact with it in the way that it was originally made. So people have been wrestling with this idea for many, many years. Now, JPEGs and MPEGs at the moment are quite, uh, they're a good container of things because as far as we know, you know, a JPEG from 20 years ago still works today um where it gets more complicated is if you've made a bespoke piece of software as an nft that maybe uses an api and i've done a lot of things with data and apis they get shut off eventually so your thing no longer works you know so those are always issues that are going to everyone thinks i think that digital is like it's all ones and zeros and it's embedded in there and it will last forever and it just it's just it isn't the case so i think it there's a job to be done for curatorial assistance and and the people who know about such things not me is how do you store and i think these things are happening these discussions are happening is how do you store digital things particularly proprietary things like i said jpegs but what if someone changes how it in 50 years, 100 years, what if we can't view JPEGs anymore? You know, it's <laughs> it's which sounds crazy, but it, who knows what we're going to be viewing and, you know, what is the formats? So that's a really interesting conundrum that someone needs to, to solve, I think. So in a way, there's no kind of way to safeguard oneself um, from this. No, no. Well, at the moment, it's like a, a, a format that is ubiquitous, which is, you know, your JPEGs and your your, your MPEGs. But um, I don't think anything is un, infallible, um, you know, short of embedding it in steel, you know, so it can last like that. You know, these are the problems that Brian Eno and friends have been, you know, the clock of the long now, you know, this long term thinking that I find really fascinating 
because we we tend to work in you know very you know can we view things in a billion years i don't know you know will we be alive who knows but yeah hopefully if someone's still looking at my work in a billion years i'd be happy so, <laughs> yeah i mean yeah I, I agree with you it's a nightmare it's and a real nightmare to make artwork out of the digital and um as you said yeah, i've also used like apis and stuff and aggregation uh in cheng talks about it as attending a garden you can't really leave it um things just stop growing or stop working and um it's a pain in the ass yeah and i i rise home who's a organization which is the new museum has done a lot of work in this respect about archiving but it, it it's it's difficult like you know so much early or even mid web art has been lost um and yeah so it becomes a matter of like okay well if things are no longer if the thing if the apis aren't working if the you know if, if the 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 work can no longer speak to the outside world it's we need to sort of try to capture that moment somehow we need to preserve it um but it's uh it's difficult and also like you know yeah these these nfts um can they still be around in a hundred years? Who's going to host the servers that they're on? Um, all these questions need to be answered. Exactly. Slightly terrifying, but also at the same time promising, I, I guess, um, in terms of the future and what it holds. Um, speaking of the future, and I guess one last question to you both is in, what is it, five years or in 10 years? Let's make it 10 years time. Where do you see yourself? Where do you see the work? progressing to what's your what's your ideal plan or vision Ed, you first oh me um <laughs> uh well i mean i'm a fantasist so uh i'd be worried to answer that question um yeah i suppose like i'm i'm interested in in building as i said like nurturing structures and to um yeah, and just to keep exploring things, I, I can't really, it's a difficult one, like 10 years, what is that? Um, it's a long yeah, time. Yeah, just to keep, it's a long time. Well, it's a long time, it's a short time. As I older, time is definitely speeding up, and I don't like the sensation of that. Um, I remember, like, being in art school thinking, like, oh, yeah, just uh, being able to just keep making surviving off my work would be classifiable as successful, and I still believe that. And so that would be okay to me just to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, as to any particular visions, I, I can't speak to them at the moment. Super, thank you so much. And you, Brendan? Uh, yeah, I, like Ed, I don't have any, you know, I don't really think about, you know, what I'm going to be doing in 10 years. It's, it's hard enough to think about what I'm doing next week, but, um, <laughs> It would be nice to be, I'm often reminded of that LCD sound system uh, record, Losing My Edge, you know, I'm, uh, I'm losing my edge to the kids that are coming up from behind, you know, who are, are all really, really nice as well. So it's, you know, if I can still continue to, to make work that people want uh, and still learn, I, I love, I'm, I'm learning new things every day. That's what is amazing with digital stuff and, and the, and the, the resources that we have available to us via, you know, YouTube's or the, the internet in general, email is amazing. I know people hate email, you know, email brings me opportunities every day. Um, you know, so yeah, I, I think just trying to remain curious and, and just trying to push, I just go deep into my craft more. Um, probably I think make less things, but better things. I, I want to make less, I think. Um, I was once, you know, I once, once read the book about longitude and, and how Jonathan Harris, or John Harrison, sorry, um, he, uh, it took him 50 years. And I think, wow, he's been working on one project for 50 years. It's like, it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing these days. Right? Yeah. So, so it, that kind of, I'd probably get too bored, but yeah, I, I love the idea of just going deep and slow and just seeing, you know, just 
just developing your craft and just being becoming trying to be better really other than that yeah super thank you um well i think as a kind of closing remark and again i apologize for losing two of our panelists along the way um but i thought we did pretty well i hope you all enjoyed it um i guess what we take from it is you know it's at a budding stage now everything that is happening where it's an exciting time that we're um amidst uh, such incredible developments taking shape at such a fast pace um and uh, all we have to do is engage with it if there's interest try to kind of collaborate i think collaborate collaborations generally is kind of um you know a theme that pops up time and time again um uh, try and make sense of 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 joining bringing both worlds perhaps not even seeing them anymore as separate worlds the physical the virtual or the digital traditional or the new kind of um uh new mediums of art specifically kind of the whole nft um based um art um and yeah and enjoy it while we can um uh and and kind of yeah make the most out of it so thank you so much once again for kibler um to kibler for um hosting us and 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 inviting me to to put the panel together thank you to Ed, Brendan, for, for, for sticking to the end. It was grueling, kind of a couple of hours. Um, David and uh, Serena, if you guys ever um, replay this, I'm sorry we had to lose you um, a few minutes into the panel, but hopefully um, uh, they'll be around. Serena, in fact, mentioned she'll be around to answer any questions that anyone might have um, via, via, via Twitter or any other social media. Um, so thank you once again. Um, and see you soon. Thank you, Mila. Thank you, Serena, Ed, David, and Brandon for being our guests today. Thank you to our audience. Follow us for more program on kiblix.org and social media. Good night and take care. <laughs>